Well, I knew the importance of the occasion. I remember Mr. Rickey saying to me that I couldn't fight back, and I wondered whether or not I was going to be able to do this. I knew that this was bigger than any one individual, and I would have to do whatever I possibly could to control myself. I felt real good as an American, much more so than as being the first Negro in organized baseball. Jack Robinson needed more than athletic ability. The man who integrated Major League Baseball needed a mental toughness never before demanded of a professional baseball player, a balanced approach to life that all Americans could eventually embrace. Robinson had impressive credentials. At UCLA, he not only won letters in baseball and basketball, he also captured an NCAA title in the broad jump and received All-American honors as a fullback. During World War II, he completed Officers Candidate School and served as an Army Lieutenant. In 1945, he barnstormed in Venezuela with a baseball team dubbed the American All-Stars and later joined the Kansas City Monarchs to begin his professional career. As a rookie with the Monarchs, Robinson caught the attention of Branch Rickey, general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Rickey sent scout Clyde Sukeforth to Kansas City to interview Jack. Sukeforth and Robinson traveled to New York, where Jack met with Rickey, and on August 28, 1945, signed a contract with the Dodger organization. From among hundreds of players in the Negro Leagues, from among seasoned veterans, Ricky thought he saw something special in this talented and mature rookie. Together, they decided to take a chance. In his first season with the Montreal Royals, a Dodger farm team, Robinson succeeded brilliantly. He had four hits, including two home runs and two stolen bases in just his first game. By the end of 1946, his batting average stood at 349, and he appeared ready to move up. On April 15th, at the opening game of Brooklyn's 1947 season, 26,000 fans pushed through the turnstiles. All eyes, including an estimated 14,000 African-American fans, watched Robinson take his position at first base and claim his place in history. The New York Times described the game as uneventful, but Monarch first baseman Buck O'Neill expressed the hopes of other Negro League stars. It was what we had been praying for for a hundred years, he said. Despite continued abuse and even death threats, Jack built a remarkably successful season. He led the league in stolen bases, batted 297, and was named Rookie of the Year. Brooklyn clinched the National League pennant, a feat they duplicated in six of Robinson's 10 years. As expected, Jack contributed more than athletic prowess. By season's end, he had won the respect of several skeptical teammates and many fans. Attendance swelled whenever the Dodgers came to town. The door, in fact, had opened. Larry Doby signed with the Indians, and Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb soon joined Robinson with the Dodgers. For two seasons, Robinson kept his temper, just as he had promised Ricky. But in 1949, that changed. He had proven his ability. Now he allowed his innate activism to emerge. This became the season that he declared his right to confront pitchers who threw at him, runners who tried to spike him, and umpires who made bad calls against him. Liberated, he rose to the top of his game, winning both the National League batting title with a 342 average and the Most Valuable Player Award. In 1949, he combined his superior athletic ability with his restless quest for human dignity. If I had a room jammed with trophies, awards, and citations, he explained, and a child of mine came to me and asked what I had done in defense of black people and decent whites fighting for freedom, and I had to tell that child I had kept quiet, that I had been timid, I would have to mark a total failure in the whole business of living. By 1955, the year the Dodgers won the World Series, finally defeating the crosstown rival Yankees, Jack was 36. As the Dodgers quietly talked of a trade to the Giants, Jack planned his own future. In his autobiography, he wrote that the time was ripe for his retirement from baseball. 
1956, his 10th season in the major leagues, would be his last. When he left the locker room, he moved easily into the boardroom. As a vice president for personnel with chock full of nuts, he improved the pay and promotion potential of company employees. As co-founder and president of the African-American owned and operated Freedom National Bank in Harlem, Jack found a positive way to influence the economic lives of small business owners and struggling families. The Jackie Robinson Construction Company was established to build low and moderate income housing. Until his death in 1972, Robinson continued to make news by raising funds for the NAACP and lending his considerable celebrity status to the civil rights movement. Through his efforts and accomplishments, Jackie Robinson not only changed a sport, he redirected American society. For African Americans in particular, he laid claim to the national pastime and more. He touched the private dreams of millions of children, not just their dreams of baseball and sports, but dreams of success, dreams perpetuated by the scholarships awarded to this day in his memory by the Jackie Robinson Foundation. Dreams of life. <laughs>